word today. And the Lord just hit us with this word that the blood has made you perfect. The blood has made you perfect. How does God see you? He sees you righteous in His eyes, perfect in His eyes, perfect in His presence. And I thank God for that. But today as we get into His Word, I just want you to realize how, how faithful God is in His Word and what He's done for us because He's telling us that He loves us with an everlasting love. He is telling us that we're in the end times. We've talked about that. We've talked about the four spring feasts, our festivals that have on the Jewish calendar, we've talked about the three fall feasts. And I, I at times have said that God, Jesus, has to fulfill the last three feasts in the fall uh, because He fulfilled the four first feasts in the spring. And yet, the more I study the Word of God, I kind of believe that Jesus already fulfilled the Feast of the Tabernacles because Peter says Christ came into this world and tabernacled among us. And there's a lot of Bible studies that you can go through indicating that Christ was born around the Feast of the Tabernacles, if not on the Feast of the Tabernacles. This year being September the 28th of 2015 will be the Feast of the Tabernacles. We've talked about blood moon. We've talked about a number of things. And there's no reason for anyone to have any sort of fear or panic in their life because we're children of the living God. Amen? We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We've said so many times at the day of redemption, you are totally, totally forgiven. And your forgiveness is not predicated upon your, you forgiving others or your confession. Your forgiveness is based upon the blood of Jesus. The blood has sanctified you, the Bible says, or made you holy in His sight. It's not acts or works of holiness that have made you holy. It's actually the blood of Jesus Christ. He says that sanctifies it has perfected you forever he mentions. And so if we look at a couple of familiar scriptures, I want to start off today in Hebrews the 10th chapter, but I want to start off in the message translation and then we're going to go to Ephesians 1, 7 and we're going to talk about the message translation again because as we go through the King James or the New Living Translation or the NIV or, or whether it be the the New American Standard Bible, whatever it is, I, I think the simplicity of the word needs to be broken down so that people can see what Christ has done totally or the finality of the cross of Christ. Because we're gathered around a communion table today. And Christ says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance. Remember what I have done. Realize it is me then lifting you up and you need to always look in the direction of Jesus Christ. Because every single scripture upon these pages that we mentioned so many times testifies of Christ. And if you don't see Christ in every scripture, you need to go back and look again. Look at it again. Because it's a declaration of Christ, he says, a revelation of Christ, as he mentions even in the book of Revelation. So Christ said, search the scriptures for them you think you have eternal life. But they testify of me. And then he says, lo, the volume of this book has been written of me. The two on the way to Emmaus, he says, as he opened the scriptures and went through the prophets and told them all the scriptures concerning himself. And the Bible says that did not our hearts burn with us when Christ unveiled himself in the scriptures. Your heart truly burns within you when the Holy Spirit tells you more about Jesus. Amen. He's the only reason why we gather together. He's the only reason why we have an assurance. He is the one the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Christ is Lord for the honor and glory of the Father. And so as we look at our scriptures today, it says here in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter 11 through 18, in the message it says, every priest goes to work at the altar each day, offers the same old sacrifices year in, year out, and never makes a den in the sin problem. It is a type. It is a prototype. He says it's nothing more than something that's taken place that is a picture of what will take place in the future when Christ takes away the sin of the entire world as He bears the sin of the entire world upon Himself. He says at the cross of Calvary. God says every single sin was taken care of at the cross of Calvary as far as Christ suffering and dying in our behalf. So then God would be unjust to try you for the same sin that He tried His Son on the cross of Calvary. We'll realize that God is not unjust. He's justified and it's grounds for justifying you is the blood of His Son. Precious blood of His Son. Two times in His Word, He audibly declares from the heavens... 
I mean, literally, he mentions that as he closes chapter 3 of Matthew and opens chapter 4. When we look at also him declaring it in Matthew 17 twice, he declares audibly that this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. And one time he says, hear ye him. So it's not trying to point towards a pastor or towards a philosophy. It's to point towards Jesus for he says, Hear ye him. Don't hear Moses or Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Hear my son, because the days of the law, he says, are the days of the prophets, and whereby they're bringing people from the law to God, are done away with. Now is the day of grace, he says. Now is the day of grace. He says, every high priest, as I mentioned, can make a dent in the sin problem. And he goes on to mention this. As a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sins. And that was it. One time and for all, never to be offered again, but taking in every single sin and bearing it upon himself, he says, at the cross. Christ was made a sin for us who knew no sin, that you and I would be made, he says, good news, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what we do so many times, we, we really don't take that in because we, we allow ourselves to still fall prey to Guilt and condemnation where God says that you and I have been set free from that through Christ Jesus. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, he says. That you now are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Why can I say that? Because he's made me that. He's made me that. That's not something that I've worked towards or tried to develop or earn, but He simply poured that out upon me and put my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and sealed me by the Holy Spirit of promise. As a, as a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it, one time and for all. Then He sat down right beside God and waited for enemies to cave in. And that's what happens. And, and what are the enemies say? Uh, well, there was an enemy in my life, and that truly is the enemy of death, whereby Christ has conquered death even in my behalf, but realizing that I was born dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says, and, and all of sin had come short of all of sin and forfeited, he says, the glory of God. But then he tells me, he says that I sit down. I sit down at the right hand of God because the work is finished. And you and I, thanking the Father for the work that's been finished in His Son, are now resting in a completed work that the older generation never rested in, even though they were to see that as a future event as they offered up sacrifices and a transfer of sins when they brought an unspotted lamb before the high priest and placed their hands upon the head of the lamb and allowed the sin transfer to take place from themselves to the lamb. And then the high priest slitting the throat of the lamb allowing the blood to flow out and then placed it on the brazen altar as a picture of the death of Jesus Christ and brazen altar being a place of judgment where Christ has certainly died for all of our sins. So he goes on to say this, it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to, per to perfect some very imperfect people. Perfect sacrifice by a perfect person who was fully God and fully man, he says, to per perfect you and I who were terribly imperfect. I was driving up uh, the Garden State Parkway with my son and I was taking him to JFK Airport and he was going to fly out to France. And I was telling him the importance of making sure he abides within the laws of the countries that he's going to. I mentioned that to him when he was in China for two months. I said, you know, you have to listen to what they're telling you. So then I, in my impatience, decided to cross over from the express lanes to the local lanes and the media cross an area where I wasn't supposed to cross after I told them that. And I was trying to look out for the state police so that they didn't see this illegal transaction. And so then I went over, I looked in my rearview mirror, and there's a police officer State trooper, three cars behind me, and he pulls up beside me and gets on his intercom and says, Pennsylvania, because I was driving a work truck that said Pennsylvania, he said, what you did is highly illegal. He said, Pennsylvania, that was highly illegal. Not just illegal, highly illegal. That's a major. And how many times in a day's time that you and I have highly illegal or highly transgressed against the law of God? 
And yet total forgiveness has been provided. And people say, well, you know, you just get people licensed to go out and sin. I've seen people sin greatly without a license. We're trying to point people in the direction of Jesus Christ. And believe me, when He speaks into your heart, He will melt your heart. And He will always come along with love. I had a man that was trying to tell me about disciplining children. Because we've had ten children, so sometimes he asks for our advice. And then he has two children. And he says, well, did I handle this right? He's got an eight-year-old and I think a five-year-old. Did I handle this right? And I said, you know, the only thing that really handles someone right, because his wife is a staunch disciplinarian, which is okay. I mean, that's fine. But you can get a child to sit down, and they can still be standing up on the inside. You haven't changed anything. But believe me, when I was in my rebellious years, 18 years old, I came home one night, and I had been gone, and they were looking for me, and my dad met me in the front yard, and my dad could have killed me. He could literally have broke me in half, but he didn't. He came out there and spoke to me very tenderly and melted me and had me crying without doing anything but speaking a soft word of love to me. Because he melted me. And Christ will melt you with his love to a place where he shows you a marvelous transformation. He's transforming you into the very image, he says, of his son. And that's the impact. So he goes on to say this. By that single offering. By how many offerings? One. Hebrews 10, 14. By one offering, he has done what? He has perfected for how long? Forever. Those who are sanctified. And how are you sanctified? By the blood of Jesus. He says this in the message translation. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process, meaning that it's not a progressive, as has been mentioned sometimes, a progressive sanctification based upon a person's work. It is someone coming to understand the message that Paul declares, and that is the day of grace. When we talk about the end times, we're now at September the 6th. We know September the 13th is the end of the Shemitah year. We know that we go into Rosh Hashanah, which you understand is the Feast of the Trumpets. We know that there's going into the year of Jubilee. As we come up, we know things are, are escalating in a direction that they have never reached this plateau before. We also understand what's taking place in the Pope and his visits, whether it be the United Nations and the Agenda 21 as they usher in the New World Order. All these things are taking place, but it's already been taking place. Agenda 21 has already been proclaimed in California. Why do you think they have such suffering, such debt? Why do you think that they have drought as they do? How do you think things are coming about as they are and ignoring immigration laws and everything else? What do you think they're doing? They know exactly what they're doing. They have an agenda, and it's called Agenda 21, the 21st century, to be kicked off the United Nations building this year on September the 25th. And you know what? I'm not here to try to tell you to, well, watch this YouTube clip, this YouTube clip. You can watch many of them. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is a good news and that you're safe and secure in the arms of your Savior, no matter what. He goes on to say this. Look at this next scripture. The Holy Spirit confirms this. This new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper, isn't going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. I'm actually putting my word into your heart. I go back to the days when there was disputes with creationism, evolutionism, whether it be a Harvard University professor against Alan Keyes or whoever it might be that are debating this issue, we realize that every single person, as I mentioned last week, when it comes to just a spontaneous time, right after they close their eyes, they're even knowing prior to that, there's something on the other side of the grave. And so God has given you and I eternal salvation. Notice what he says here as we move on. He says, he concludes, I'll forever wipe the slate clean of their sins. Once sins are taken care of for good, there's no longer any need to offer sacrifices for them. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why is it sometimes that we think that we experience 
confession of sins being forgiveness. How is it that we think that by saying something, you get it instead of realizing he already gave it 2,000 years ago when he shed his blood? He's not going to shed his blood again. He did it one time. We mentioned that last week in the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the 27th, the 28th verse. He did it one time. But the next time he comes, it's not going to be dealing with sin. That's what he says. So the Bible is very clear. It's plain and clear, in fact. We go into this to see what God says as we jump over to our next scripture. See what it says here in Ephesians 1 7? You know, if you're looking, if you have a Bible, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. But when, when I'm seeing the forgiveness of sins take place, I want you to realize that this cannot be preached enough. I find out that too many times people today, they, they take a scripture out of context and let that overrule the greatest commentary of every scripture in the word of God is the Bible itself. It's its best commentary. You have to take the scriptures that pertain to a subject and bring them together and realize that God never contradicts himself. Never. So if he says this in Ephesians 1, 7, he cannot contradict himself in any other scripture. When he says this, he says, in whom we have he says, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace as King James. The message translation is this. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We're a free people, free of penalties and punishments, shot up by all our misdeeds. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to your confession. According to the riches of His grace, He says. He cannot contradict that anywhere in the Word of God. It's plain and clear there. And when you look at the obscured many times, you try to justify a mandated belief. And I love this. I had a brother come to me and he mentioned to me, he said, how is it the church messed this up? How is it that the first century church had it right? When it comes to understanding the grace message and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, how is it that it's crept back into the church, mandated by the church, the necessity of making sure we keep the law in order for us to be perfect in the eyes of God? Where, where did that come from? It, it falls right back under the church of Galatia. If you take time to read those six chapters and understand that Paul said it's not a gospel at all. Somebody has bewitched you. So, someone has lied to you. So, someone's not telling you the truth about this message of grace. So he goes on to say this, and not just barely free either. <laughs> love, didn't just you know, get by by the skin of my teeth. Not just barely free. I mean, abundantly free. Not just barely free, abundantly free. I, I love the way Eugene Peterson puts so much of this because it, it's simplified. It's declaring what's been declared and I don't understand it. Because the King James Version of the Bible is written on an 8th grade level. Reader's Digest was written on a 4th grade level. U.S. News and Time Magazine is written on an 8th grade level and people don't like reading those magazines. I can't understand it. So let's break it down. Thank God that he breaks it down. And he says simply this, you're abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans. He took such delight in making. He took such delight in making. He goes on to say this. He said, he set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth, it's all Jesus who's victor over death, hell, and the grave. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given me everlasting victory in yourself. So let's start here now. Let's look at the book of Matthew 17, 1 through 8. This is the King James. And real quick, I mean, I just thought this past week, and I've, I've certainly enjoyed the messages of uh, when I get a chance, and it's not very often any, sometimes, but uh, Joseph Prince, I love his teaching. I mean, we've got a chance to see him in Newark, and, and I love the ministry of the gospel of grace. God has certainly lit our fire in about 1995, and I, I thank God for the messages being taken around the world. And people can, you know, have their own opinion as far as saying, well, it's just... Too liberal in his teaching, though it sets you free and sets you free indeed. I, I went through this situation with 
And I was talking to my wife yesterday, and she was listening to someone about setting an individual down and showing them in the Bible where their sin is wrong, where it's wrong for them to, to exercise a certain act. And I said, the guy's totally off. And I respect the individual for what they've been used to do, but they're totally off. It's not my job to sit down and say, okay, brother or sister so-and-so, in passage here, uh, what you're doing is declared wrong by God. That's not knowing the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's simply taking them into, and I love to start with John, the first chapter, and I go through who Jesus is, the great and conquering king, who is God and Lord of all, and I want to tell you that your creator loved you so much that he's done all this for you. That's where it's at. That's knowing the truth, and then the truth will set you free. That's where it's at. Because I can go and point things out, and if you look at Eugene Peterson's translation of Galatians 6, that one will melt you as well. Just, just take time to look at that. Because if you have a brother who's overtaken in a fault, simply realize this, that you could be going down the same path in another area and fall yourself, but always come alongside of each other and restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering yourself because we all face temptation. And so I sympathize and I really come to the place of empathizing with someone that has a tough time in any area. Because I've been there. I, I know where I was. I know where God has tried to reach me. And He always brings me. And I know it's God speaking because He's always showing me the sun. He's always bringing light out of darkness. It's the Holy Spirit's job, He says, to show you more of Christ and His work. And we realize if you are a person that's demonstrating the gospel into any person's life, you're doing the same thing. And he mentions this. He says, and after six days, Jesus take up Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. It says that it was transfigured before them, and his face shine, did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. Now, his face was as bright as the sun, the, the Shekinah glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God that came down in the tabernacle and temple area to show the presence of God was visible right there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And I've taken three people. I've taken Peter, James, and John. We've all heard the translation of their names before. Actually, the stone of the law being replaced by grace. That's exactly stone Peter and the replanting of, of James or Jacob, which is the Hebrew versus the Greek. And we understand that that is a replanting or a replenish or basically a transfer to grace being John. And he goes on to say this, it was transfigured before them. And, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. He says, talking with him. Now there's Moses and Elijah. There's no greater two among the Jewish people than Moses and Elijah. We have Moses known for the law. We have Elijah basically known as a restorer of the law. We realize that the kings in those days, they departed from the law. There was a prophet sent to bring them back to the law. And the law did its job in bringing every man to the end of himself. That was the, the law's job, to, to bring you to the end of yourself so that you may finally give up. So we have this lawgiver and this law restorer being in Moses and Elijah. We have a Moses that died of 120 years old and God buried his body or hid his body away. It is a picture of the Old Testament saints that died in Christ Jesus. He's there as a visual on the top of Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Hermon. Being the highest elevation of over 10,000 feet in this mountain. As they stood up there and saw Christ, Jesus Christ, turned to the Shekinah glory of God. Revealing, he says, as he, he peeled back the flesh and showed forth the glory that he poured out upon you and I, honor and glory. And so we also have Elijah who never died but was taken up in a, a chariot of fire. A whirlwind chariot of fire was taken up from the face of this earth. And I, I do believe the two witnesses of, of Revelation 11. But when I think about Elijah being taken up, he is a picture of the New Testament saints that the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be evermore with the Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen? 
So he says this, And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. And here's the fourth verse in Matthew 17. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now, I don't see Jesus even asking him a question, but he's answering Jesus. No one asked him to say anything. But he puts on the same level Moses the law, Elijah the restorer of the law, and Jesus who is grace and truth. He put them all on the same level, and that's what the church many times tries to do today. We're going to bring everything into a balance. Sorry, God's not interested in us trying to mandate a balance. So he goes on to say this, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. So here we are on the Feast of Tabernacles, everyone making a little hut outside of their home, to remember what they went through regarding the terrible situation of going through the wilderness journey for 38 years, basically 40 years, but we know the first two, God intended to take them in. And so he goes on to say this in the fifth verse, Matthew 17, 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, God the Father, speaking in such authority that he's proclaimed it from the very lowest level of Jordan to the very highest place of Mount Hermon. It says this, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What? Hear ye him. Not Moses, unless he's proclaiming through his word, which is all a picture of Christ as well, as the law brought us to the end of ourself to show us Jesus Christ. The same way that with Elijah, the prophet, he says, directing people back to God. Here we find out Jesus is who's totally grace. He's totally grace. And God the Father is saying, Hear ye, hear ye Jesus. Hear Jesus. Hear the voice of my Son. Hear the sacrificial lamb of God that took away, that took away, that will not take away, but took away the sin of the world. And then he goes on to say in Matthew 17, 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. They were afraid when they heard the Father's voice and said, Hear ye him, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. They're trembling, they're on their face. I had a guy this past week that flew in from well, actually drove in from uh, Virginia, going through a battle. He told me, he said, I'm going through a terrible time. with My, my wife is involved in something, and we pray with him. He says, I've been on my face so much. I didn't even know he was a Christian, but as we continue, Joel and I taking him out to dinner all week and talking, we realized it was a tough situation he was facing. He's lost 22 pounds. His wife is, is not cheating on him, believe me, uh, but it's another thing that they're facing, terrible situations they're going through right now, and, and he knows Jesus is the answer. So we had a chance to talk the gospel somewhat. My point is that it's all hear Jesus through the trial that you're facing. Look at the seventh verse. He goes on to say this in Matthew 17, 7. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. The Bible says that Jesus, the Lord Savior, came over and touched them and actually didn't just say arise, but literally lifted them up. And told them not to be afraid. So the times that we're going through, you may be on your face, you may be afraid, you may be facing difficult situations, and Jesus comes over to you in a very tender way, touches you, and he lifts you up. But I like this. And that is, it is in the, not the active voice, but the passive voice. It's not active as if you need to do something in lifting yourself up. It's in the passive voice as it's already been done by Jesus Christ who's lifted you up. He's lifted me. Remember the old hymn, Love Lifted Me? Love lifted me out of my sin and my desperation for Jesus who's done it all came over and grabbed a hold of me in a very tender way and lifted me up and said, Arise. Did he do that to a 12-year-old girl who was lying there dead and said for her to arise? Did he do that to Lazarus in the tomb that was bound with great clothes and told him to arise and told the people who were around Lazarus to, to take off the garments. I had a guy in here last week, Warren Chandler, who gave me a revelation that he had regarding that Lazarus situation about the unbinding. He said, God gave me that revelation. I said, man, that's powerful. You know why? Because God, God gave me the same one a month ago without him and I talking, and I feel like it was fresh revelation to me. He said he thought it was fresh revelation to him. The Holy Spirit's telling us the same thing, and he's telling a lot of other people the same thing, that those who are bound with great clothes, those that are bound with the law and death, he says, those who are around them, unbind them. That's what he says. And Jesus touched him and told him to arise and be not afraid. Look at the next scripture real quick, please. And I don't have time to get through all of it, but look at it. And when they lift up their eyes, they saw who? 
who they said, they didn't see Elijah, they didn't see Moses, they only saw Jesus. When you have the Holy Spirit working in your eyes, he's only pointing you in the direction of Jesus, Jesus only. Look at what he says here, Second Peter, the first chapter. He said in the 15th verse, moreover, this is Peter getting a, a visual of the fact that God is showing him by the Holy Spirit that he's about to part out of this life. You and I know that Peter died on a cross upside down as a martyr's death, as, as all of the apostles did outside of Apostle John, who lived later in life, up into his 90s. And the Bible tells us he was on the Isle of Patmos, and God gave him a revelation there. And, and he was a person that was even carried sometimes in and out of the temple in the latter days of his life. And said this simply, love one another as Christ loved you. Going on, he said, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, it says, to have these things always in remembrance. And this is the Mount of Transfiguration. He's speaking of 2 Peter 1.16. It says this, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made, when we made known unto you the power. Now this is the end time coming of Jesus Christ. We made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his majesty. Now this is the point I'm trying to bring up. We know we're living in the last days, very last of the last days. Christ could come at any moment. We're not trying to dictate a time or an hour. But the point is this. He says there is power at the coming of Jesus. There is nothing in heaven and earth greater than the power of Jesus. He says, I already am your shepherd. You shall not want. You shall not have a need. I'm the one that's protecting you and taking care of you. I am your Shekinah glory. I am your Jehovah, Jireh, provider that knows everything that's going on. I am your great shield. I am your Nisai. I am your banner over you. I'm your Shalom. I've made you whole. I'm complete in every way. And I simply want you to do this. I want you to call upon not El Shaddai or even uh, Elohim. I just want you to call upon the name of Jesus as you go to your daddy father. You have a daddy who is a daddy who's made a provision that gave his only son, Jesus, that said he sent back into our hearts a comforter that would be exactly like myself. He is the Holy Spirit. That even during the trying times when the news is not good, I want to tell you about the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he goes on to say this. He says, For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well placed. And then finally wraps up this and says, 2 Peter, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when he said we were with him in the holy mount. He didn't forget it. He's up to the end of his life and says, I don't want you to forget it either. Don't forget this. And then just closing real quick, look at Romans with me please. And we'll close with this, Romans 3, 20 and 21. He says this, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law does not come the knowledge of God. By the law does not come sanctification. By the law comes the knowledge of sin. You can stand up here and you can demand and demand and demand. You can preach where people are wrong and hold them hostage or even in captivity. And you can tell them what the law states and say that you're not living up to it. But the Bible tells us specifically that that law only tells you that you're a sinner to bring you to the end of yourself. That you might fall at the feet of Jesus Christ who's made you a saint in himself. And he goes on to mention this. He says, look at this, 21. But now the rights of God without underline the law is manifested. Be witnessed by whom? By Moses and Elijah. It was witnessed by whom? By Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they represented that, and it's still represented today. Realize this, it is God declaring you and I righteous without the law. And this is a witness of every single Old Testament prophet, he says, as well as the entire law of God that Jesus Christ fulfilled and tells you and I that we've been made free, set free, and free indeed. Amen? Child of the living God. Let's go before him in prayer.